Hi, I'm Willie, and welcome back to my channel. Tonight is the inaugural Knowledge Nugget. So we're going to try to explain Spanning Tree. I'm going to try to move through it quickly. This is a video, so you can pause it, you can rewind it, all that good stuff. I hope you learn a little bit of something along the way. So let's get to it. Like I said, tonight is the inaugural Knowledge Nugget. I'd like to thank Tim Bear over at tbear.com for creating the Willie Howes Knowledge Nuggets logo. And I do want you to know that uh, none of the contents have been made with chicken byproduct. It's very important. Uh, and we will be talking about Spanning Tree, uh, STP, not Stone Temple Pilots. So if that's what you're here to see, you might have to tune out. So let's get to it. Spanning Tree Protocol. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, why spanning tree is important, but before we get to that, let's talk about how we get there, how we kind of discover it. So when, uh, when we're designing networks, we want them to be able to recover from faults easily, and a fault can, can be something physical, it can be something logical, um, and you have to look at it at multiple layers. So the physical layer, um, the data link, the network, so on and so forth. Um, routing protocols handle, handle layer three, which is the network layer. So if you're f familiar with like OSPF, it would be able to handle the redundancy in layer three. Layer two, which is the data link layer, there are no routing protocols used. And active redundant paths are not allowed. So STP, spanning tree protocol, provides the redundancy for layer two. So when you first take a switch out of the box and you plug it in, and I am also going to use switch and bridge interchangeably here. That's why it says uh, here bridge equals switch because it, it is one and the same for all intents and purposes. This is kind of a high level overview. So if you take one of these devices out of the box and it doesn't matter who the manufacturer is, it starts out dumb. It doesn't know where anything else is on the network and to figure that out as a switch, as a bridge, it has to build its MAC address table. So how does it do that? It listens, it listens to incoming frames on each port and what it does is it maps uh, or correlates the MAC address of the sender to a port. Does that make sense? So it assumes that the device owning the MAC address is behind the port the frame originated from. So think about that for a second. Um, and then it cor so it correlates those MACs based on this learning and then it can forward frames directly to that port. Um, if a broadcast comes across a switch, um, it gets forwarded or flooded out of every port except on the port it was received. If other switches are plugged into this switch, by default, if something is, is broadcast, if it's flooded, it's not only going to go from the switch you know that made the request, it's going to go out the links to those other switches. And then unknown frames, which are also called unknown unicast, will also flood the switches. Um, if you want more information on that, go out and do some, some Googling. Um, like I said, this is kind of a high-level overview so you understand why STP is important and why we use it. Um, and, you know, there are entire classes based on spanning tree and the design. So feel free to do some Googling around. Not going to offend me. All right, so most of the time, bridging and switching is done and it is transparent. And when it is done and there are no problems, it works really well, um, but there is no redundancy. So what some people like to do is just take multiple, you know, switches and just run two or three cables between them. Horribly bad if you have no STP. Um, if you do that, you will have switch or bridging loops and broadcast storms on the horizon and they will crash your network. That's what will happen. Um, and you have to be careful of this even when you're designing. Um, let's say that I've got a, a barn and I've got an office and I rent the barn for things. Um, I can even create, you know, uh, bridging loops when I have wireless links because wireless 
um, operates, you know, in, in the same fashion. You know, we're connecting segments of networks. So you have to be careful and cognizant of it in uh, all of your designs. And it can act and, uh, happen accidentally, even with just two switches, or I've seen it happen with one. Uh, I was called in to look at a network at a school, and this is a true story. I don't know what the voice over IP uh, phone provider was thinking, the, the phone system maintenance folks, when they didn't have STP turned on or port security. or It was just a very bad situation, but what had happened is in the teacher's break room, a child was sent in there uh, as a punishment, and there was a phone sitting on the conference table. And if you're familiar with voice over IP phones, they have an input that powers them and gives them data. And then there's usually a switch port uh, where you can plug another, you know, machine into or another, you know, printer switch or whatever. And over on the wall, there was another port leading back to the switch. Kid gets curious. For some reason, there was another cable there, plugs into the phone, plugs into the wall. And... Uh, yeah, it didn't last real long. They had major problems. Things quit working on the network, and we uh, we had to go take care of that. Had STP been turned on, uh, that switch may have had a better a better shot at it. Um, there were a whole lot of things wrong with that with that scenario. So, so what's a bridging loop broadcast storm? You say. Um, this picture I borrowed from, uh, I think it's like a Dutch site that, um, I couldn't read it in Google translate, couldn't translate it either, but I was looking for a picture that, that was, that simply summed up a uh, bridging loop or a broadcast storm. And you may, oops, you may want to pause this, um, and read this, um, if it doesn't make sense the first time you hear it, but I'm going to read it. And then kind of think about it, and you can look at the, the picture. Now, what you've got is you've got two switches that have two links or segments. So um, you've got a bottom segment and a top segment. And I'm going to preface this. If I, um, if this, like I said, if this is confusing, pause it, read it, do some Googling for some other examples. But this picture I thought was really the simplest of everything I'd found. So strap in, here it is. PCA wants to send a frame to PCB. So the frame goes out switch X on the top segment and both uh, switch X and Y receive it on port one, but PCA hasn't been stored yet. So they both put PCA's MAC address in their table being received from port 1 and assume it's from the top segment. PCB is unknown to both switches, um, so the switches know to flood the frame out of all ports in an unknown unicast. So each switch floods the frames out of port 2 on the bottom segment. PCB is on the bottom segment, so it receives both frames. Switch X now hears the new frame forwarded by switch Y, and switch Y hears the new frame forwarded, forwarded by switch X. Switch X sees this frame from PCA to PCB, even though it learned where PCA was above. The source address of PCA is heard on the bottom segment now, so the switch has to start relearning. Switch Y does the same thing. They still don't know where PCB is, so they flood all the ports to figure out where PCB is. Now we learn where PCA is, and we forward those frames creating a loop. So we just start broadcasting all this uh, stuff because we've got this, I mean, we've literally created this circle. So if that didn't make sense, please pause it, reread it, um, and ask questions. Enter STP Spanning Tree Protocol 802.1D. And what it does is it makes the switches aware of each other and their connections. Redundant links are shut down until needed. And it does this using BPDUs or Bridge Data Call Bridge Protocol Data Units that are exchanged between switches. There are two types of BPDUs. One is configuration, which is used for the computation, 
uh, which you'll see here in a minute, and the other is topology change notification, which announces changes in the network. BPDUs are by default sent every two seconds, so the topology is kept current and loop free. BPDUs contain the protocol ID, the version, the type, the flags, the root bridge ID, the root path cost, sender bridge ID, port ID, message age, max age, which is 20 seconds, hello time, which is 2 seconds, and forward delay, which by default is 15 seconds. So um, in spanning tree, there has to be a root bridge. And what the root bridge is, it is a common frame of reference for all of the other bridges. And to get a root bridge, we have to have an election, election amongst all the connected switches. And how the root bridge gets elected is it has a lower bridge ID. And the bridge ID is composed of these two things, a priority or a weight, and a MAC address. And over here I took a screenshot of our Ubiquity switch in Unify. And so the standard um, default priority is 32768. As you can see, Ubiquity uses that default, that standard default. And then it also has the MAC address tied with it. So when all of your switches are powered on, they all think they're the root. They send out a BPDU with the root and sender IDs as themselves. So now um, what it's going to do is they're going to find out who's better. And the root with a lower bridge ID, which is based on priority. So if they all have that same priority, now they're going to go over to the MAC address. And the MAC address is the tiebreaker. And after it's uh, the root is elected, only the root will send updates. Now that the root is elected, all the other switches, switches must figure out where they are in relation to the root. And how do they do that? With a root port. And each switch selects, each root selects a, a each switch it selects a root port that points towards the root switch. And is based on cost and is based on the total cost of the links that lead to the bridge. The lowest cost is the winner. How are these costs calculated? Here's a, an example that's probably relevant for 2017. A 100 meg link is 19, a 1 gig link is 4, and a 10 gig link is 2. And those are the costs of those speeds. The cost is collected via BPDU from the root, which has a root cost of 0. The next closest neighbor adds their path cost from the port where it arrived and sends it on down the line, and the BPDU contains a root path that is the sum of the costs behind it. So as it goes down the line, it is accumulating those costs. Each switch stores the incoming value as well to keep track of the costs for adjusting links. So now that we've learned about the network, it's time to get rid of any potential loops. And there could be loops because um, we're still learning. So there could be, you know, multiple connections to each of those switch. And what we're going to do is we are going to now get a designated port. And a designated port is going to be the port that will send data from the switch out to the segment. And it is selected based on the lowest total root path cost. And then if there is a tie, these are things um, that are involved in breaking that tie. So the lowest root bridge ID, lowest path cost to root, lowest sender bridge ID, lowest sender port ID. Um, all the ports go through um, STP states, and so we're going to cover those real quick in order. One is disabled, and that is a port that an administrator has physically shut down or that is disabled because of some sort of an issue and the system could actually be in charge of disabling it if, the, if there's a problem. State number two is blocking, and this is where every port starts, and in the blocking state, ports only listen for BPDUs. The next state is listening, and we move to listening from blocking, and it moves, if it can be a root or a designated port, 
sends traffic. Um, a listening port can send and receive BPDUs, and it becomes a grown-up port that is a root or designated port. Yay! If the root port status is lost, it goes back to blocking. The next state is learning, and after a forward delay of 15 seconds in listening state, ports move to learning. A learning state can send BPDUs and learn MAC addresses to build the table. It still cannot send frames or data. The next state is forwarding, and after another 15 second forwarding delay, we move to the forwarding state, and a forwarding port can send and receive data, receive MAC addresses, send and receive BPDUs, is now a grown-up port. The standard from the IEEE is 802.1D, and it is STP. There is also RSTP, which is Rapid Spanning Tree Protocol. It allows for a little quicker convergence times. Um, some manufacturers have their own versions that are proprietary and require special encapsulation. I am probably not going to cover that. If you're going to go for those uh, types of certifications or installing that kind of equipment, you know, uh, get that information directly from the manufacturer. And I want to thank you for watching this uh, short video covering spanning tree. And at the very least, I hope it has encouraged you to go out and learn more about spanning tree. So that's what I want to cover for now. Uh, use spanning tree. Don't get into this broadcast switching loop situation. Um, join me on Saturday for the very first Security Saturday. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. If you want to see more knowledge nuggets, let me know down in the comments. If you've got topics you would like me to cover, uh, please, uh, like I said, give a thumbs up. Please subscribe. Please comment and share. And we'll see you in the next video.